Salve, salve, meus amigos! Estamos aqui agora no Crash TV, aqui no YouTube, no Rockwave Edição Especial, aqui ao vivo, com o grande vocalista Neil Turbin. Então, sejam todos bem-vindos. Já começamos aqui a nossa grande live de hoje. Neil Turbin, que foi vocalista da banda Anthrax e também hoje vocalista das bandas Death Riders e também de outras bandas clássicas aí do nosso grande Heavy Metal. Então, vamos começar aqui. Já estamos aqui com algumas pessoas ao vivo. Então... Bom, vamos dar aqui as grandes boas-vindas ao Neil Turbin. Hello, Neil. How are you doing? Hey, what's happening there, Guilherme? Greetings, everyone out there in YouTube and all over the internet and the world. Hope everyone is doing well. Great, great. So, how are you doing, my friend? Excellent. Just uh, rocking. Wow, keeping that's it, great. Keeping it metal. Wow, really nice. So... Uh, now we got, let me just uh, check something here. I'm going to just change something here in the camera. No problem. I wanted to mention also my, my band, uh, Neil Turbin Eastlos. That's, uh, you know, the band that I play with in Los Angeles and, you know, here in the United States. And of course, uh, you know, playing my solo music and playing, uh, playing out there. So in addition to Death Riders and Bleed the Hunger, and Scream and Soul Demon, so Neil Turbin Eastlos. And I also do singer-songwriter. So wow, that's... Wow, that's... Oh, sorry, dude. Uh, well, that's really cool, dude. So we got another... We got a, uh, many bands, right? Well, you know, you just want to stay active and keep on rocking and, and be out there playing and, you know, because Death Riders and Bleed the Hunger are primarily based in Sweden with Jonas Hornqvist and, uh, you know, Richard Sward and Gert Nybor over in uh, Breda, Netherlands. So my team is over there for Death Riders. And then also for Bleed the Hunger, it's Jonas Hornqvist and myself over in, he's based in Sweden. So, you know, the complications or the difficulty right now with uh, people in different countries, as you, I'm sure everyone's well aware of the scenario. However, in um, Los Angeles, you know, I have Neil Turbin Eastlos and then You know, I'm able to do my singer-songwriter stuff as a solo artist. So that's more uh, R&B. Great, dude. Really nice. So, talking about a little of your career. So, in 2003, my first question, it's about your solo career. And you've released a solo album called Threat Con Delta, right? That's correct. In 2001, we recorded that album, Threat Con Delta. Great. So, by the way, I've listened to Keep the Fire, and I really like it, dude. So, Thank you. do you have plans to release more solo albums in the future? Well, uh, the issue with that album, you know, Mark Nathanson had Jet City Studios. I, I own the masters to the album, but I don't have the masters, so I can't even do anything with that album. I'd remix it, and I'd do something with it to give the fans and give them something to appreciate a better sound because, you know, technology is uh, improved by, by uh, teraflops, as they say, you know, leaps and bounds, you know, nano technology and all that. So there's a much difference, a, a low, you know, 2000 to 2020, so to speak, 20 year time frame. So it would be great to have the opportunity to re engage and re, re remix remaster However, that's uh, unfortunately not an option at the moment. Um, I heard even regarding Fistful of Metal that, I don't, I don't know if it's, it's something I might have read out there, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not true, but you know how the internet is. But it stated that they lost the masters or they can't find them. But that's okay because from my standpoint, I would re-record that whole first album, also include Armed and Dangerous uh, EP and Spreading the Disease songs that I'm responsible for as well as even maybe some demo songs as a bonus. So that's something that uh, Neil Turbin Eastlos, my solo band, would be able to uh, deliver. And the band is exciting. They're, they're young and rocking and ready to strike and ready to rumble. And uh, we rehearsed last night, as a matter of fact, and, and got together. And uh, we're going to be doing some shows soon in L.A. 
just to get out there and uh, stay active. Really great, dude. That's really, really great to know. Okay, so my second question, it's about your time in Anthrax. So about the album, Fist Ball of Metal in 1984, okay? Sure. Came out, came out in 84, recorded in 83, correct. All right. So I've seen that sometimes you perform with your band, some classics like Death Rider and Metal Threshing Mad. So my question is, What's the song from this album that you enjoy the most to perform? You know, I, I, I'm asked those kind of questions often, like which is your favorite or which one do you like? I think, um, you know, certain songs have different, um, you know, there's different challenges in different songs. Each song has its own set of challenges. You know, whether it's high notes, whether it's long notes, whether it's, um, you know, just arrangements on the song, ring out endings, things like that. I would say that, you know, I don't know that I have a favorite in that respect, but I, what I, what I think about is I try to keep every song on the same level. So my, my delivery has to be stronger on certain songs to keep the level of, you know, some songs maybe aren't as well written as other songs from that first album with Anthrax. So I would say that you know, maybe you have to put a little more into certain songs to deliver it harder or to, to, to just emphasize more things. But I don't know, when I'm on stage, I just give it a thousand percent. So there's no, you know, I'm not holding back anything. But I think for certain songs, um, it definitely requires pacing. And what I mean by that, you know, there's a lot of high notes, there's a lot of um, pushing a lot of uh, air and pushing a lot of power. So it's kind of a matter of structuring the set the set list along with, you know, Death Rider songs, along with Neil Turbin songs that, and, and Neil Turbin Eastlos is also writing songs too. So that's another thing. But I would just say that you, you want to pace songs. So every single song is not gung ho, <laughs> you know, cause it's hard, it's hard to sing certain songs cause there's not a lot of room for breaths and not a lot of room for gathering air for pushing the notes and holding them for a long time, like death from above. So you really want to, you know, doing it back to back to back to back. I mean, and typically the way I roll is, you know, we go hard and heavy. We, we, you know, start to finish, we grab them by the throat and then put them down at the end. So it's, it's like, there's no, there is no vacation. There is no break. There's no rest. And it's, it's all about, you know, pushing forward and um, going hard. And I like to keep a certain tempo. So I think, um, you know, if I had to say which would be a favorite song or which would be a, a preferred song, I'd say some of the mid tempo songs, or some of the slower songs are not always going to be my favorite for live because, you know, it kind of, unless it's got a significant role, it can drag down the momentum. You know, you want to have a certain tempo, a certain performance level, a certain momentum. So I think, I think, um, you know, if you think about songs in anybody's set, it, it's like some of those slower songs, maybe that is the way that they, that band, that's what they're known for. But I think uh, those up tempo songs gets, gets the blood pumping. And I think we want to keep that, blood pumping we, we don't want to send people to uh you know at the movie theater to the popcorn or the bathroom you know we want to sort of keep them in the, in the in the pit rocking out so thrashing about wow that's incredible dude so um you were talking about uh we have no vacation no resting i think this is um this is something that musicians unfortunately don't have. We don't have any resting or vacation. We just work every day, every time, and we sing, we play every time, dude. That's correct, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it's gotten, it might have been different back in the 70s or 80s for some folks, but not for myself. And it, there's never been a rest. It's just a matter of if you go out and play somewhere. I mean, that is the vacation. Like you're getting to see a new place you never saw, maybe. And uh, you don't get to hang out there like at the beach in Cancun. I mean, you go to a place in Mexico and you play in a, you know, a nightclub or you play in a venue or, or, or an outdoor, the you know, uh, a venue like Moda Fiesta, Leon or something, you know, really cool places, lots of people. But you, you know, you get to hang out there. Sometimes you get to stay for the whole event, the whole, you know, two or three day festival, if that's the option. But Sometimes it's just you're in there one day, then you're into the next place or even a partial partial day, not even a whole day. You show up, you 
hope that there's time to eat and use the facilities and get on stage and get off stage and then go somewhere else. So, I mean, depending on how far the travel is and that's, you know, that's what happened, you know, with, with uh, certain tours that I've been on where, you know, you got to travel and there's so many long drives, long, long trips, you know, timelines that you have to be at sound check super early. So it's like, let's get out of the venue and we got to go. And the fans, they want to talk to you. They want to have to take photos and sign stuff. And me, I always want to talk to the fans. I always want to spend my time till everybody, you know, is happy and everyone gets to, to have their moment, you know, and it's only fair. I mean, you got to appreciate the fans. That's, that's who makes everything worthwhile. You know, it's all about the fans, but you know, when you've got an eight hour drive from Edmonton to uh, Vancouver on the back, back side of the Rocky mountains uh, in the snow, well, you've got to, you know, you got to get going. Come on, Neil, let's go. I mean, we got to go and drive and go. So it's that kind of a thing, you know. But, you know, but the experience is, is being on the road and being, you know, preferably being with a group of people that you like being with. Unfortunately, in my case, you know, it's not always been people that were compatible. You know, you know, it's not a person's fault. It's just, you know, in relationships, certain people get along very well and, you know, you meet these bands that are like family, you know, and they all get along like family. And when they treat each other with um, integrity and respect and and consideration, then that's what it's all about. And, and people look out for one another. They're a team, you know, they help each other. You know, they lift each other up. You know, if someone, if someone falls down or they get hurt, you know, they help that person. They don't kick the person down and throw them in the gutter or something. So I've been in those situations where, you know, even if the person isn't your favorite person, you always help them up. You always got their back. You, you know, if it's your, your team, you know, people should play as a team, but you know, in my case, I've been on in situations where it wasn't team players, you know, they just, I never had the opportunity to be on the team because I was never accepted as a team member. You know, I was just an outsider kind of situation. So in that circumstance, you know, that's not ideal, but I really admire bands that have, you know, that are family and you just have to, really appreciate those bands because those are the ones that seem to survive and, and, you know, they emanate, they give off energy. You know, we all are energetic beings. So I think that they give off an energy that you can feel you can, you know, it translates to how do you feel from that person? How does that, per when you walk away, how does that person make you feel? I mean, to me, that's what life is. You know, you like, what, what does that person make you feel when you walk away? Not how, not how did they edit you? Cause they had the, 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 the footage. So they edited the footage and how they made you come across because they were able to chop it up and push it out there. But it's how, you know, I'm, I'm not being edited right now. So I'm talking and people can hear what I'm saying and not, you know, hear partial phrases or sentences or words. So it's really about what people feel, you know, if they feel that, that I'm a jerk and they don't like me, well, you know, they are entitled to feel that way. And if they think, Hey, you know, I'm someone that's down to earth or someone they can relate to, or they can understand, then that's cool, you know, but I'm not going to judge people because they have an opinion. We all have opinions and especially on the internet, there's a lot of opinions, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Lots of opinions. I can see lots of this. You can't, and... you can't win over everyone. You can't, you know, get everyone on your side, but you know, Hey, I think that I'd rather be, a, I'd rather be dead and hold on to my integrity than be alive and be, a, be full of shit, uh, be a liar you know, or, or be yeah. someone that doesn't care about other people. You know, I'm, I'm a person of great empathy and great care of other humans, you know, so it's all about helping other people and helping other living beings, you know, and not, and being respectful of that. And I think really that's, you know, that's who, who I want to be, you know? Yeah, of course. I think you're pretty right, dude. And uh, this, uh, what you talked about, about integrity. And this, I think this is the most important thing when we go when you gotta play with a band and we all as you as you said before we need to be a family so we need to support our friends and our uh, our uh, bandmates and they need to support us as well so we need to help each other that's the point and i know when you say um stuff like uh, oh uh, sometimes i uh people uh didn't play it as a team people didn't play as a um, as a family so all uh, so they thought by themselves and something like this actually this is not a band dude <laughs> i think the well, i mean band... you could 
Guillerme, you can hear people when they say in a, in a conversation, you ask them a question, I, 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 and me, 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 and I, me, me, I, you know, it's not about me. It's about you. And it's about everyone out there. It's not about me. And it never will be. And it never was. But if you can lift somebody up and, and like BB King once said to me, cause I was on his tour bus and back in the nineties one time, cause a friend was interviewing him and he was, you know, really warm guy and really cool, you know, very, very heartwarming, you know, kind of a human. And he said, Neil, cause I said, BB, what were you thinking? You know, you had Lucille and you're playing it. And it was new year's Eve and you're looking at the crowd. And, and I said, BB, I saw that look in your eye and you stopped playing and you're like holding Lucille and you're looking out to the crowd. And I said, BB, I got to know what was in your mind right at that moment. You know, he's all dressed up for New Year's. Everybody's there New Year's Eve in Redondo Beach at this place called The Strand. And he had his tour bus there. So afterwards, we got on his tour bus, you know, and he got relaxed, put up these chairs. He had these um, these white kind of these plastic lawn chairs like in the back of his <laughs> bus. So we're sitting on him. I was hoping that we weren't all going to fall through because we're all big guys, you know, so I was hoping we didn't break the chair. So anyway, I said, Mr. Beebe, tell me, please tell me, what were you thinking when you stopped? And there was a, you know, I had a no. And he told me and he said, Neil, it's from here to here. And I'm like, thank you, Mr. Beebe. That's all I needed to know. Have a great new year and love you, man. You're the best. <laughs> that was an amazing show. And then that, that's really the truth. You know, I just, that's all about for me. Oh, damn. I think we have some back connection here. You know, a little. Oh, oh sorry. I was playing society. It was, you know, it's just the way society was. So the factors of society and. It had to be extremely difficult to, you know, be in that circumstance of things like that. So I just have the utmost respect for, for the artistry of a master. Ixi, acho que caiu, gente. Ai, ai, ai. Bom, ixi, tá travando aí, né, galera? Putz. Calma aí que ele já volta, gente. Segura aí, segura a onda. Neil, can you hear me? Eu. Ai, caramba. Ah, ixi, ele caiu, gente. Ai, meu Deus do céu. Gente, perdoem-me, é, parece que tivemos aqui um problema de conexão. O Neil Turbin, infelizmente, caiu aqui. Putz. Bom, vamos, vamos ver aqui se ele vai voltar. Estou esperando aqui é, ele entrar de novo. Tá ok, pessoal? Bom, enquanto isso, vamos fazer o seguinte. Opa, parece que ele voltou. Oh, hey, there Neil. We... So sorry, dude. Hey, no worries. I'm, I'm here. So, uh, so keep. Uh, what, so, what part did we lose? What part did you lose? Well, um, I think the the last part. Um, I remember you, you were telling about uh BB King, the the words that he said to you, and okay. it's like um, it's it's like this to this. Yeah, this is the last part I remember. Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, what BB King was telling me is about giving. The the biggest reward is about giving. Help lifting other people up, you know, and to me, that's the best thing about music. You know, what, what's better than that? You know, it's nice to play a flashy guitar solo. It's great to hit high notes and sing all kinds of melodies and play fast double bass or play these cool songs. But, you know, the honest truth for me is, you know, what's going to move people. And, and that's really what it is. And there was another instance where I met Ronnie Dio, not for the first time, because I, you know, I played with Claude Schnell, who is the, keyboard player for Dio for 10 years. So I played with Claude for four years and it was just me and Claude, you know, so he'd play his Steinway and Sons 1887 grand piano and I would sing with him in his living room. And we were working on songs, his songs for uh, four years, performing those songs. So, I mean, 
very much Elton John meets Meat Loaf meets uh, theatrical operatic, uh, you know, very cool music and rock and music. And of course, there's a bit of that Dio flavor in there as well. And also Claude was in Rough Cut and did other cool projects that he's been involved with. But, you know, there, there was a, a training involved. You know, you're singing with a piano that's perfectly in, intonated. So it's like there's no room to mess up. You know, it's like you're on point or you're not. There's not a there's not an if it's a only on or off. It's like either you're on it or you're not on it. And so that really helped me vocally to even fine tune myself, you know, to, to the 10th power further forward, you know, as a musician, as an artist, you know, to work in the classical terms to, you know, work in fifths, work in sevenths, work in thirds, work in all these different, you know, intervals, all these different components, all the, all the musical theory of, you know, what's taught. And, you know, I, I had never been trained formally, but working with these amazing artists and having the opportunity to, you know, work in, in and out of these types of scenarios. I mean, it just made me a better musician. And of course, you know, I mean, I sing, and play and write and play guitar. And I'm working inside of progressive music as well as soul, modern pop soul, R&B. So, you know, when people say, oh, you know, there's no good artists, no one writes any good music anymore. Well, yeah, you know, you know, everything sucks if you don't try anything new, sure. Everything old is the only thing that's good. But I'll tell you what, there's some great stuff that's old. There's some amazing, amazing work that's out there. And, and it's, you know, if you, if you wanna look at, uh, classical compositions it's really hard to beat chopin it's really hard to beat you know um you know some of these different you know mozart i mean it's not like you're getting composers that are just popping up left and right doing that all the time or if you want to take the 70s or the 60s even for example you know there's not a lot of beatles or stones coming out and there's not a lot of led zeppelins and there's not but there are Eita ferro, travou de novo, gente. Ai, ai, ai. That because there's prodigies who are just born with, you know, me that have to, uh, that aren't prodigies, but have to work hard to try to catch up to those prodigies who already started off at the finish line, <laughs> you know, and I'm trying to catch up. So I just feel like, you know, it's always about pushing yourself to be the best that you can be. And, you know, always learning, always taking in, you know, the, the knowledge and, you know, it's a lot easier to, well, not easier, but it's a lot, it's a lot more important to listen because you don't learn if you're talking, except you hear yourself. And for some people that's important. I'm just trying to give you some data, give you some information and, and share that with everybody. But I really like to listen because I learn a lot and I'm a student, you know, always first. Wow, that's really great information, dude. So <laughs> great. Now, um, my next question, it's about um, your co-writing songs with Quiet Riot. So you wrote the lyrics of the songs Insanity and Change or Die, right? Yes. Great. So about the song Change or Die, especially, which was your inspiration when you were writing those lyrics? Well, that's an excellent question, and I appreciate that, uh, Guillerme. Uh, Change or Die was an intense song for me. It was the first song that I, I, I try to write to both songs. First, I was writing to Insanity. And what's ironic about Insanity is that it seemed like a faster, more up-tempo song, which it is, but it was harder to write to. And the original lyric I came up with, I, I, I started writing to that one, And it, and it turned out to be a little bit harder than I thought, you know, even though it had a flow, you know, zeppelin -y kind of a flow to it, but faster. It was definitely heavier than most of the things that Quiet Riot did. And, you know, with double bass attack and all that, you know, Frankie Benali came to me and, and at first it was like, okay, um, Neil, I, you know, just wanted to see if you'd be interested in, you know, writing, co-writing some songs with us and, which was Frankie Benali and Neil Citron and, um, and the band. And what happened is I said, sure, Frankie, what I, I just said out of curiosity, what makes you think that I'm a writer? Because I know people know that I could sing or at least some people do, but I just wonder, you know, I played with Frankie before in 1986, we did an album, Cooney mask. So 
I was just wondering, like, what makes you feel that you're approaching me to write songs with you for Quiet Riot that would be that would make you want me to write on, you know, I mean, that's Quiet Riot was number one with a bullet, you know, bang your head, mental health, all that. So it was kind of like, you know, a shock to me, like, well, that's kind of cool to say the least, an honor. And I was blown away. And so he just, I don't know, I guess people must know that I can write some songs. I mean, yeah, from Anthrax, but you know what I mean? Just in, you know, we're not, we're not talking about Anthrax. We're talking about, you know, something that would chart on billboard or something that would be, you know, and they weren't looking for a hit song. They were looking for something heavy, but I felt like change or die. was, it was one of these things where, you know, it's, it's like a thousand percent or nothing, you know, it was that like either you step up to the plate and you deliver or you fall down and you disintegrate. I mean, it's, it's either one or the other. It's, it's either all or nothing. And that's really the inspiration for that song. It's just about giving it everything and, and putting your heart and soul. Your essence, you all on the other song, Insanity. So I wrote, I ended up writing Change or Die first. So I delivered that song to Frankie with my demo on the song, me singing. And, you know, of course, he had it for you know, the singer in the band, that was not me because he was going to sing the song. So I was like, I didn't think anything of it. I, I turned it over to Frankie. And then that was like, it took about a week to do that. Maybe a little bit more. And I mean, that was hard. That was hard pressed to go write a song and sing it and deliver it and have it be good enough that he's going to put it on the album. Well, I knew that song was like solid and I felt good about it. And sure enough, you know, Frankie loved the song. He said, yep, that's definitely going to be on the quiet riot album and i was blown away with that and i figured okay well let's see how the second one turns out he's like how fast can you get it he's like frankie i need like i need at least a week to do this you know it's like well so i turned in the other song actually i had it i was already working on that other song so i turned it in and it was kind of more tongue-in-cheek lyrics a little bit too you know rat poison docking you know great white, you know, just more tongue in cheek or Motley Crue, you know, just more of the kind of lyrics that would be sunset strip type lyrics. And he's like, Neil, you don't have to sing these lyrics. You know, James Durbin does. And this is not right. Like, in other words, this one's not quite there. I, he said, you could do better than that. So he didn't say, oh. hey, it sucked. But I'm like, I knew that that was kind of like, man, I hate this. It sucks. No, he didn't say that, but he's like, you know, I know you could do better than that. And I felt like, Oh crap. You know, here, here I am. I wrote this melody to this song and I have lyrics for the song. And now it's like, they don't like the way that that came across. So it's like, I've got to rewrite the melody and the lyrics, which is not an easy thing. Cause I didn't write the structure of the song. This is a hard song to kind of put into perspective so what happened is i was playing with the this cover band at the time and i you know i was going to this uh, conference this way out in palm springs that i was meeting with some folks and i had some time in my car and i'm like you know i the, the day before or a few days before i came from this this meeting with this group that was you know just not they were not being very nice let's put it that way and so it became a, a much different kind of a song. It became, you know, living the life of insanity. You're pushing me over the edge, can't you see? So it became this more gnarly beast of a song. And the lyric really worked for me. And it was, you know, the aggression of, of the parts and, and the message. So I think that is the message on that song. And it really does come across, in my opinion, to to that effect. And I was quite astounded that, you know, Frankie really loved that song. And you know, I love to change or die. And, I, and the other one was like, okay, here's a crapshoot. You know, is this going to work? Cause I knew that the lyrics were too tongue in cheek before. Now it's a different song and it's, it's kind of wild. I mean, that was, it's like just the phrasing of the, the chorus. It, it was, it's like very tight. It's very, it's not an easy flowing. It, I mean, it flows really well, but it just, it was a harder song to kind of put the puzzle pieces together. So with that being said, I thought, wow, 
you know, for, you know, at least I got one song on the Quiet Riot album that Frankie told me. So that's that's good news. And I was surprised when both of them ended up on the album. And then Frankie calls, call, you know, contacts me. He messages me and says, hey, Neil, do you have a photo? I'm like, well, sure, Frankie. So I didn't want to, you know, I, I sent him over a photo I had that I, you know, hadn't used before for any kind of media or something. So I sent that over to him, just a regular snapshot. And he says, well, we're going to put this on the album. I'm like, you're going to put my picture on the album? I'm like, holy crap. Thank you. That's amazing. Why, what can I say to that? You know, like, that's pretty thoughtful. And and then he says, hey, Neil, he calls me up like another week or two later. Like, hey, Neil, uh, you got those tracks that you sang on? I said, sure, Frankie, why? You want me to send you the, you know, backing vocals or whatever? It's like, well, yeah, I want all your tracks because we want to put your backing vocals on the song. I'm like, okay, sure. I was just blown away by that. So they ended up using my, my vocals on two of the tracks, those two songs, and on the backing vocals. And, um, you know, because I did it kind of in a unique way. And I was just blown away. You know, I was like, I never thought in a million years that I'd end up, uh, you know, singing on a Quiet Riot album. I mean, I'm not the lead singer, but I was backing vocals. And also uh, having two songs I co-wrote with Frankie Benali and Neil Citron on, on, you know, Hollywood Cowboys on Frontier Records. So that was, uh, that was really a thrill to me that that would happen. And I just want to mention a couple of other quick things, just since we're on the recording songs topic. And I was also asked to uh, sing with, uh, in 2019, when things were still open and bands were touring and things were alive and not uh, suppressed and locked down and all that, I was asked to sing with Hammerfall on stage and Joachim Kahn's asked me to sing with Hammerfall. And I was like, sure, sure, Joachim, I'd be happy to sing with you guys. He's like, no, you're not going to sing with me. You're going to sing and I'm going to watch. And I'm like, what? Yeah. And that's what happened at the whiskey. It was the, the unbelievable. I mean, I love Hammerfall and they're great people, but, and great musicians. And I got to sing, Hector's hymn with them. And that was amazing. And Blaze Bailey, before Hammerfall came out on that same year, Blaze Bailey in May of, of 2019 asked me to sing with him. And I got to do a short little interview, but I got to sing with him. And that was just incredible. I mean, um, I, I really, I have greatest respect for, for Blaze. And I think he's one of the, the you know, best people in, in the music business absolutely what a a wonderful human being and what a you know what a fantastic artist and singer and and brilliant brilliant man i mean he so on point to have the great respect Um, I don't want to leave anyone out. So Dave Evans, original singer from ACDC. I also sang with Dave Evans on stage uh, in 2019. And that was really cool. And also I sang with Whiplash out of New Jersey. So that was an incredible opportunity to do that. And I also wanted to mention that I also sang with Thor just before the, uh, the lockdown happened. Thor from Canada and the mighty Thor and the one that blows up, you know, hot water bottles and bent steel and with his teeth and his hands and all this. And wow. And, uh, I, and Thor asked me to sing on his album, brand new album on Cleopatra records. That's coming out. There's a song called we fight forever. And I sang on a song with Thor and I know they're about to roll out a big announcement about it. So I guess maybe I'm jumping in the pool a little early, but Hey, you know, I'm so thrilled that I was uh, asked to participate in that. And, you know, I saw Thor back before I was in Anthrax in New York, you know, met him back then. So that's uh, coming full circle. And then um, in addition to that, I'm also writing, co-writing a song with a, a really good, good friend of mine. His name is John Ingrassio. And he runs a, um, he's the founder of a program called Music Matters. It's a charitable um 
entity that, you know, helps kids and helps to foster, you know, better musicianship and, and, you know, to work with these kids to really, and, and, and big kids too, to really, you know, make a difference and to, you know, bring another level of, 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 uh, coaching and, and mentoring. And it's just a really cool thing that he's doing. And he's got some big names doing that. You know, he's got Matt Sorum and he's got, uh, Jocko Pastorius, the son who was on there just before I was. And he's got, um, anyway, so he's, I, I can give you a list of more names. I mean, he's, uh, JMO from the Allman brothers, people like that much bigger than my little self, you know, compared to <laughs> the biggest names in the business. And he's doing a, a song with, uh, you know, he played me something with Gilby Clark and Matt Sorum. And I'm like, wow, this is an amazing song. And then he, then he plays me something with, uh, Steve Gad on drums and, um, you know, a singer that sounds like Eric Clapton on one of the songs. And then he sends me this other song and he says, Hey, Neil, what do you think about putting some vocals on this song? And I'm like, well, this one sounds pretty cool. And I'm like, who's, who's playing on it? He says, uh, Tom Petty's band, <laughs> part of them. It was, uh, you know, Steve Ferrone on drums and Beaumont Tench on the Wurlitzer keyboards. And it's a very, you know, it's got really that Stones-ish, you know, Tom Petty flavor, but also kind of Otis Redding. You know, it's kind of interesting. It's got even a 60s, 70s vibe. And, you know, I happen to play ball in that kind of a ballpark. I mean, I write not just metal, not just rock, but also, you know, R&B. And I have a lot of roots in that, you know, old school soul and R&B, you know, Memphis soul and, uh, you know, Motown and, and Northern soul and, uh, I mean, great songs, great songs. Great music is great music. I and mean, when you can figure out the puzzle pieces and write something that fits in that world, it's great. And, you know, I'm just excited to, to have the opportunity. And who would ever think, you know, that I would even have an opportunity to write songs and be on a track with the Heartbreakers. You know, that's crazy to me. But, you know, it's all about pushing. You just got to keep pushing and, and keep pushing boundaries, you know, because that's how you get over. Uh, that's how you get to the top of Mount Everest, or at least you can keep trying. Wow, really great. So um, uh, you're writing um, we're a song with two members from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, and that's really great to know. And just a question before we move on. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the fact that you're uh, singing a song with Thor uh, with their new material. So do you have a release date for this new song, this new album? Well, it wouldn't be fair for me to talk about Thor because that's their um, baby and it's also, you know, Cleopatra Records. I'm just mentioning that I sang on a song, you know, that I was honored to, to be asked. And because we're here, you know, live on on YouTube and also talking to Brazil, you know, Crash TV. Um, but I think there's a lot of exciting people on the Thor album. I mean, he's, he's collaborated with a number of people. So I'll let him tell you about that. And I can tell you that Kevin... Stuart Swain is someone I work closely with. He's over there in um, Vancouver, Canada, and he's uh, one of the, the players with Thor, one of the bandmates. And also, you know, he's also one of the recording engineers as well. So it was, it was just a great experience and great people to work with, just people that will treat you right, people that are wonderful people and, um, you know, just exciting because, I mean, I knew Thor back in, you know, early 80s you know i was there at the long island seeing thor perform and i knew him because i you know I, i saw him in new york city you know because that's where he was back in the 82 83 time frame so it was like wow this is crazy that here i am you know it's not 83 anymore right and, <laughs> yeah. and, and i'm singing on a thor album so this is pretty neat and and it's just you know it's nice when you go go for full circle and people have have appreciation for what you do and there's love and respect and, and just, you know, camaraderie. It's just, that's, that's what it's about. You know, everyone, it doesn't happen with everyone, but when it happens with good people, you know, you, you just got to give the love back and appreciate them. Oh yeah. That's really great. dude. And so before we continue, let's uh, have our welcome to our friends here from Crash TV. Então, muito bem-vindo a todos aí, Henrique Takemoto Jaza, o nosso grande repórter do Crash TV também, dar as boas-vindas também 
ao Robert Coelho, do Panela do Rock, Marcelo Led, Renan Xeradia, nossa grande Tati Reis, nossa produtora, e minha querida irmãzinha caçula, Ana Clara Mafra. Sejam todos bem-vindos, pessoal. Robertson de Já, Regueiros de... Como é que é? Regueiros de Já, curtindo de Florianópolis, Santa Catarina. Grande salve para Florianópolis de Santa Catarina. Sejam todos bem-vindos, galera. Este é Neil Turbin, ex-vocalista do Anthrax e atual vocalista da banda Death Riders. Bom, all right, let's move to our first block from our interview. So, now this is time for the block Opinions About. So, Neil, I'm going to ask your opinion about five singers and you're going to give your opinion about them. So let's suppose I'm going to ask your opinion about this vocalist and you're going to say your opinion about his performance or his vocal techniques or something else you feel free to talk about. Right? Are you ready? Absolutely. Okay. So the first vocalist I would like to hear your opinion about it's Rob Halford. Well, Rob Halford is a, um, a very seasoned theatrical vocalist from before Judas Priest. I mean, he was a vocalist that, um, you know, he wasn't the first vocalist in Judas Priest, as we all know, but he definitely took things to a different place and a, and a you know, definitely to a, to a pinnacle, you know, and I think um, there's probably not a more definitive uh, vocalist for heavy metal besides Rob Halford and Ronnie James Dio. And, you know, we can probably put a few more names. I mean, of course, Bruce Dickinson has his place in there as well as, uh, you know, Ian Gillen. And um, I'm sure Ozzy belongs in there too. And I'm sure there's quite a number of other vocalists I haven't mentioned, but, you know, you get the idea. I mean, it's all these outstanding vocalists from these huge bands. And, you know, if they brought something unique that was not, a copy of someone else, not a carbon copy, but it was something that was very unique. And if you really want to, okay, bomb. My hair. Pretty vocal. Very, you know, they had, you know, that uh, gravelly or, or scratchy kind of. Uh, Ai, meu Deus do céu, que conexão, gente. What a phenomenal novel. And, um, and, and, and there's more. <laughs> I can keep going. But I think... Um, oh, shit. I think we, have, we had some bad connection again. So... Uh, <laughs> all right, that's... Sorry, dude. Okay, keep going, keep going. Now it's fine. Yeah, so... So where did you lose me? Or where did it drop off? Um, I think you were uh, you were going to say something. Uh, I don't know if you said Bob or something like this. Okay, well, let me give you let me just give you a quick rundown. So you've got Halford, you got you know Dio, you've got Dickinson, you got Gillen, you got Ozzy, you know you've got Bon Scott, you've got Biff Byford. You know these are phenomenal artists. Phenomenal singers. You know, you're asking me about Halford, but all of these singers are unique. Udo Dirkschneider, he doesn't sound like Bon Scott. He does have that gravelly tone to his voice, but you know it's Udo. They bring something unique. So to me, that's unique. And I have to give him, you know, much credit for sounding unique. And the same thing for Mark Storacci. Even his gravelly tone, you know, very soulful, it's in that Bon Scott world. Udo's in that same world. But they're all different singers. They all sound different. They all sound like themselves. And there's other there's other heavy metal singers that also deserve to be in that uh, that that framework of 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 singing. I mean, you can't not include David Coverdale and Paul Rogers. I mean, not exactly. Well, Coverdale definitely heavier heavier uh, songs. Paul Rogers more soulful hard rock. But 
still, you know, it's all in the days that free was playing and all that, it was really heavy. And, you know, your competition was Jimi Hendrix and the who, you know, I mean, so I would say free was a heavy band, you know, and, and yeah, compared to black Sabbath, maybe not the same thing, but they were, you know, even Aerosmith, you know, is in that same realm, you know, cause going back to the seventies and even before it's just the sound. And even the Beatles had moments where they were, you know, predecessors to heavy metal. So I think, you know, you can really go back and look at some of those artists and, and, you know, then you have uh, Phil Mogg and you have, um, um, you know, I would say Michael Schenker group, you know, Gary Barden and Graham Bonnet, you know, I mean, the list just keeps going. I mean, there's that many amazing singers. And of course, some of them are in a later generation, but I think, you know, when you bring something unique to the table that sets you apart from the competition, I don't know if that's the right way to phrase it, but just the fact that it's not competition. It's like you're trying to be art. You're, cr you're creating art and you understand that this is what other people are doing, but you're doing what you're doing and you do it the way that your artistry brings it out there. So I think that's one thing. And then there's, you know, copying. There's people that copy others and try to be someone else. And I think that's, you know, you need some guidance to get there, but I think you really need to be your own person. That's why Halford is so, you know, unique. I mean, he sounds like Halford. Freddie Mercury could also be another vocal that you would consider to be a forerunner of heavy metal. There's some pretty heavy elements of that. And, you know, what a, what a prodigy of a singer, you know, <laughs> amazing performer, you know, all of those things. Kiss, another, another band, you know, you can't really leave out Kiss out of that mix because they're also, you know, huge influence. I mean, they were heavy metal back in the day, you know, everybody wasn't just spitting blood and breathing fire and having a, Kiss Alive 2 stage show like that. So I would say, um, yeah, I mean, and we can keep going. Ted Nugent, I mean, it keeps going. And then and then you have all these progressive bands or these uh, pop bands that were top, you know, even bands like Boston and Kansas and Journey and Foreigner, you know, that was also an impact. Toto, this was all an impact in that heavy metal, you know, melodic singing. It's just a different you know, reflection. And that, that's probably more radio, more AOR type of singers. But I mean, you ask me a question, there's your answer. It's a long list. I can't really just put it on Halford. You know, I have to say all the, you know, Dio oh, <laughs> and the different cool. eras of Dio. The different eras of Dio were phenomenal. Some of it was heavier. Some, some of it was more melodic, more structured. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Okay. I think I'll live. Thank you. Yeah, it's not COVID, right? I don't know what that is. Okay. All right. The second vocalist now. Ready? So, I want to hear your opinion about Blaze Bailey. Well, I think I, I already said uh, how wonderful Blaze is as a, as a person. And his singing is great. You know, he, he's, um, you know, ex the X factor. And, uh, you know, I think it was a different era for Iron Maiden, you know, kind of like what happened with, um, Ripper Owens and Judas Priest kind of like what happened with Ozzy Osbourne and, and, and with Dio, you know, not, and, and, uh, Black Sabbath, you know? So there's a time where things, I don't know, it, it's like cyclical, like you have peaks and valleys, you know, it's like, a like, I guess physics or something, you know, the, the sine cosine, it's like mathematics, tangents, cosines, sine waves. And, um, you know, you're, you're riding the high part, part of a wave and then the wave comes down to the low point. And, you know, after 10, 20 years or whatever happens because of, uh, people growing apart, drugs, um, you know, life taking you in a different direction, all kinds of different things or the business, you know, maybe you're not playing stadiums anymore you're playing arenas or you're playing theaters or you're playing clubs i mean that definitely changes it changes the perspective for some folks and you know maybe it's because they have kids or whatever reason family reasons but there becomes a job opening you know at that band or, or basically that the need for that occurs not you know we know that happened with ozzy and it was very ironic how ozzy was able to a band together that was you know just as just as uh you know 
it, it made an impression like Ozzy Osbourne's band Blizzard of Oz did, you know, with Randy Rhodes and, you know, and, and Bob Daisley and Lee Kerslake. I mean, that was just like, wow, wow. And um, I would say the same sort of thing kind of happened with Deep Purple. You know, a lot of fractures, a lot of split offs. And, you know, then you have this White Snake band and then you have, you know, Glenn Hughes. And I mean, the versions of Deep Purple. So I think it's just something that happens in relationships. You know, it's hard to. So the Blaze Bailey uh, version of, of uh, Iron Maiden, I really like. I enjoy Blaze with Iron Maiden. And, I, and you know, it's it's just. You know, if you look at Black Sabbath, which I don't know, is it really Black Sabbath or was it the Tony Iommi solo band? You know, the, the years with Tony Martin. I really love Tony Martin. And I think, you know, what a phenomenal singer. And I love those records, too. So Blaze Bailey, I love his, his work with Iron Maiden. But I think as a solo artist, you know, he's phenomenal. It's the same. It's not different. You know, it's like his level of, of um, you know, delivery is is right there with what he did in iron maiden and yeah it's different than bruce dickinson but to me you know i grew up with paul diano so i thought wow this is um something else you know murders in the rue morgue and uh Wrathchild and all that and running free so i was used to bruce to, to paul diano i really loved him but then when i saw bruce dickinson i saw them on the number of the beast tour opening for judas priest screaming for vengeance at madison square garden I happened to be there with Scott from Anthrax. We were both there together at that show. And uh, that was 90, 1982. And holy smokes, I mean, that was that was the time to see Iron Maiden. That was the moment. You know, Number of the Beast tour, I mean, and Screaming for Vengeance. I don't know that you could have a better two-for-two, two, you know, tour with strongest albums of metal. But that was pretty strong. I mean, the only thing they were missing was Dio and Lemmy. But... <laughs> But I got to see something like that at Long Beach Arena where, you know, three of the coolest bands were playing. And, you know, this was just at a downturn for metal, but they were, you know, resurging and coming back. So I think, yeah, it's, it was in a valley, a peak in a valley. And that's kind of where Blaze was in Iron Maiden. And, you know, I think it was he in the band four years. I mean, that's a long time to be an Iron Maiden. I mean, that I mean, Blaze is such a great guy and and great person to work with and very, very sharp and very intuitive. And I mean, that's a guy that you, you definitely want to have blaze on your team. Cause he, he's just, you know, very good businessman, very excellent musician, very great with the fans. I mean, you know, what, what an amazing experience to be around blaze and his fans. I mean, it was just incredible. And to sing with him on stage. I mean, I, I couldn't be blessed more than to have that opportunity. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think Crash TV had the same opportunity because we interviewed Blaze Bailey two weeks ago. And oh, my God, he's such a really, really great guy. I totally agree with you, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's all kinds of people in the music business, but Blaze is just, you know, a real, you know, real true spirit, real true heart, you know, great person. And I, I just have the utmost respect. And, you know, it's, it's I learn, I look up to Blaze, you know. I mean, he's a mentor. He's a, he's a role model for me, you know, because I, I admire what he's accomplished and what he's done and what he continues to do and the way he does it, the way he handles himself. Yeah. And of great I integrity. Could, yeah, I, I could see this uh, on him, of course. And yeah, I think um, I would like to interview Blaze Bailey someday again because, oh, my God, he's really such a really great guy. Yeah, okay, I mean, he, so, treats, he treats people okay. like gold, and he treats his fans like gold. I mean, that's it, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah, of course. I, and I can only yeah. learn from, from Blaze, you know, that's the way. Yeah, sure. Uh, I remember uh, once I was in his concert here in Belo Horizonte, in my town, and oh my God, after you leave, please do, don't kill me, because <laughs> I, um, I took a picture with him, and I, and I got an autograph, and I lost both. Oh, damn it. I lost my autograph from Blaze Bailey, and I lost my picture with Blaze Bailey as well. Oh, my God. Oh, man. That's that's painful. Yeah. Well, we, all, we all make mistakes, and, you know, Blaze is the kind of guy that I'm sure that he'd, you know, I'm sure that, that he'd want you to have a picture with him and, and want, you, want to sign it for you. I mean, he's that kind of guy. I, I mean, I already know that, but I'll let him speak for himself. You know, I can't 
do that. But, but he's, to me, that's, that's the kind of person he is, you know, just like, like my house is your house, you know, mi casa, su casa. I mean, he's just that kind of a person. And, you know, I, he, he's the kind of person that will make you feel right at home in his home, in his dressing room. And that's where I was. And it's like on his stage. And it's like, wow, what, a, you know, it, it's, it's like, I, I've been in bands where the band doesn't want you to be on their stage and you're in the band, but this is blaze Bailey and he wants you to be on this stage and he treats you that way. So it's, it's incredible. I mean, what, he, I can't say enough good things about blaze and that's just, you know, that's, that's just a pure feeling. Oh yeah. That's really great. Okay, dude. Well, unfortunately we're almost on the end of the live, but can we, um, can we have one more block to end, to finish? Sure. So now it's time for the block. If you, so now do you, we got nine questions and you're okay. going to choose for me three numbers from one until nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine. So you can choose the first one. I'm going to choose eight. All right. That's, so that's number... an infinity symbol. Great. So number eight, if you had a vocal student and he asked or her ask you to teach him or her one of your songs, which song would you teach? Well, it's funny that you should mention that because I have my own vocal instruction and coaching. It's called vocalfirepower.com. So people in Brazil can, and, and in Latin America and all over the world, they can, you know, take lessons one-on-one, -on -one, private master vocal session with me. And when it comes to which song would I teach, I think it's all, it, it all de depends on the, the level of that singer, that the, the finesse, the prowess, the breathing technique, the ability of that singer. So I would probably not teach them uh, a thrash song. I would start with something that is going to teach them how to, you know, how to manage their breath management, air management, you know, how to breathe the right way. And then, you know, you're not just breathing the right, right way, you're on stage, you're moving. So you have to breathe and also not get out of breath from running around if that's what you do. So that's one factor. Then also sustaining notes, hitting the notes, getting the pitch. Also the steps, you know, each step, like you want to imagine a staircase, you want to be on each step, you know, one, two, three, four, five, not one, two, three, four, five, you know, you don't want to just slur it and slide those <laughs> stairs. But you know, when you hear people sing in journey and, and, and uh, queen and karaoke, you know, Freddie Mercury and Steve Perry, they hit every step. They don't slide down the sliding pond. <laughs> you know, they don't go, blah, 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 blah. you know, it's not, it's not stumbling, but you hear a lot of karaoke singers and it's like, why do they pick Steve Perry and, and Freddie Mercury? Like pick someone that you can sing versus the, the hardest, most finesse singers there are ever. So with that being said, I mean, they've written some of the greatest music, so I can understand why they would sing that. However, I would say that um, I can try to help someone sing songs from Anthrax, like Metal Thrashing Mad, but they have to have a lot of power. They have to have a lot of uh, ability to pinpoint notes, you know, like right out of the gate, Death from Above. You know, I still sing these songs the same way. Exactly. So... I mean, my band, Neil Turban Islos, we play these songs as part of our set, all of them. So, Arm and Dangerous. I mean, that's my song that I wrote. Even though it was said in some interview that a person wrote 75% of Fistful of Metal, well, I guess they don't remember that someone else wrote the lyrics and the melodies, and that would be me. So, anyway, I wouldn't want to... Um, try to make someone, you know, go the longest distance on the first lesson, I would want to build up to that. So I think to go and try to sing Metal Thrashing Mad or Death From Above Out of the Gate or Subjugator, it's a lot of a lot of lyrics, a lot of uh, breaths. You know, you need to, a Death Rider, a lot of, there's a lot of piercing notes. There's a lot of, you know, boom, boom, boom. You know, it's left, left, right, left, right, left, left, right. You know, it's just boom, 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 you know, pushing energy. So it's all about pushing that energy. So working with other songs where you can learn how to, you know, do these jabs, these jabs and, and, and these vocal, you know, 
embellishments and also their staircase movement. You know, there's lateral movement like there's Stevie Wonder. So certain singers have that ability where they they move within the song, like, you know, your Mariah Carey, your, you know, your Christine Aguilera, all that kind of, you know, a, a great example would be Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston, you don't really hear in some of her music um, a lot of the lateral movement like Stevie Wonder, but she can sing all of that Stevie Wonder kind of lateral movement. Usually you hear these big notes. You're, you're hearing the, the Rob Halford notes. You're hearing the big, big delivery, the Freddie Mercury, you know, the big um, um, grand delivery. But it takes, you know, it takes a lot of effort to pinpoint how to open up and how to, you know, get to that place and also sing in your, your mid, you know, your chest voice, your lower range of your voice and also to the top of your range and learning where your voice sounds good and what songs and what style of singing works best for your voice. So I think these are the considerations. So when you say which song would Neil pick to uh, teach a student for the first time, it's like, well, you know, don't expect to be evil Knievel jumping over Snake River Canyon on your first motorcycle run. You know, I would say that's probably a safe bet unless you're unless you're daredevil like he was. <laughs> All right. So um, you said about uh, your website that you used to that you your um, your teaching your students, yes. right? Vocalfirepower.com. And that's available to anyone that wants to, you know, take lessons or, or you know, you could do a single lesson. Or you can sign up for five lessons. There's a package deal for that. So, you know, we're trying to make it very reasonable and affordable. And also, you know, usually I'll go the extra mile and, and um, you know, give a person a lot more than just, you know, 60 minutes to, to work on a vocal lesson or session. Eu acho que a conexão deu pau de novo. Bom, é, vamos ver se ele vai voltar aqui, galera. Ih, eu acho que ele caiu. Bom, pessoal, só é, aproveitando aqui, eu fiquei de é, traduzir é, isso que ele acabou de falar. Para quem tiver interesse, o Neil Turby também é professor de canto, galera. Ele tem, inclusive, aqui um site que ele falou com a gente, que é steamfirepower.com. Eu não sei se é exatamente isso mesmo, vou perguntar aqui para ele outra vez. Vamos esperar só ele voltar. Neil, can you hear me? Ixi, não, ele caiu de vez. Bom, vamos ver aqui, gente. É, a gente já está quase no final, mas espera aí que a gente vai ainda tentar é, olhar qual que é o website aí para quem tiver interesse em fazer aula de canto com o Neil Turbin, ex-vocalista do Antrax. Vamos ver aí qual que é o site que ele tem aí para nós. Bom, vamos esperar ele voltar aqui. É, ok. Hey, Neil. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I, was, Can I, take uh, that I just want to say, I want to send greetings out to Taddy, to Taddy Reese, since she was so cool and, uh, you know, bringing me on to this interview. And, um, you know, she put that together recently. So I just wanted to give her a special shout out and a hello and greetings. And thank you so much, Taddy, for um, the opportunity to speak with Guilherme and all the Everybody at Crash TV today in Brazil and all over the world. Well, that's really great. Então, é, o Neil acabou de mandar um salve aqui para Tati Reis, a nossa produtora, por é, ter intermediado esse contato aqui entre nós. Ele está aqui fazendo os agradecimentos a todo o pessoal. Um, so, oh, Neil, can you say the, the website again? Yes, I was just finishing before we had maybe some interruption on the connection. So, the website is vocalfirepower, vocalfirepower.com. Ok, então pessoal, And, é, oh, sorry, sorry, you, you can complete. Oh. So vocalfirepower.com, and we teach you, you know, it's it's a, you know, I'm not here to teach people about philosophy and religion or, or, or Eastern ideas or anything like that, but I will say this, my vocal process is much like Bruce Lee, so in the sense that Bruce Lee was an amazing fighter, as we all know. He was also an amazing actor. But the thing about Bruce Lee that impacts me the most is his brilliance and his philosophy because he, you know, some of the things he said were using no way as way, using no limitation as limitation. And that is the way that I teach vocals. So we're, we're not limited. We're not, 
we're not stuck in a parameter. We, we go beyond the limitations and we go beyond, you know, we break bad behaviors and we go beyond what you think you can't do, what you think you won't do, what you think you aren't going to do. Because we don't think aren't and can't and won't. We think can, will, and are, and going to, and will, and have to, and must. And, you know, that's why part of the conversation has to be about the perception and the and the ideas. And then once we dig into the vocal part and the drills, you know, we're, we're not just talking about a vocal coach who will go and hit a few piano notes and you'll do it repetitively every week because you can do drills, you know, especially if you can play piano or guitar, you can play the, the note scales by yourself. You're like, you don't need someone to babysit you and hit these scales. But when you understand how and what, you know, what the direction is, when you, when you fully understand from someone who's coaching you and guiding you and mentoring to understand what those goals are and to understand how to get there, then it becomes a different scenario. You're not just like in a, in a mystery room trying to figure out, you know, it's dark in here and I don't really know where we're going, but I know, I know I'm in here for math and they're just going to teach me this, you know, or they're going to teach me this physics, but there is physics, there is math. All of those things are part of vocals because you have to be able to count. You have to have vocal theory, you know, you have to have music theory principles and you have to have, you know, and that's what you learn in music schools in class, but with vocal firepower, you know, we take it to another level and we take it to a different level because I've also lived on the road. And also, you know, you get sick, you get strep throat. How do you sing and perform when you wake up and you feel like you swallowed a razor blade or, or a bottle of broken glass? How do you, you know, that morning sucks. And it's like, oh, God, I got to sing today. Oh, God, I didn't sleep last night. Oh, God, I been on the road and I got a l I had a little too much to drink and party a little too much and stayed up a little too much. And I feel like I need to go to sleep, but I have to go on stage now. How do you deal with that? Well, those are real questions and those are real concerns for real bands that are on the road that are touring today, yesterday, and we'll be doing it tomorrow. And that's exactly what I address. So you're not going to go to Miss, Mrs. Jackson in an eighth grade music class and she's going to teach you how to, you know, kick ass on a big stage or how is she going to, how are you going to deal with strep throat or how are you going to, you know, she'll teach you here's the scales. So what I do is I fill in that gap and try to help with, you know, taking it to the next level. Hopefully that's not too much info, but that's, you know, vocalfirepower.com if anyone's interested in checking it out. Really great, dude. So I hope you earn lots of Brazilian students because I think we have really, really many vocalists that I think they would love to have you as a teacher. And Thank you. I, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm teaching, uh, one of my students is this fabulous singer. She's also a concert pianist. I didn't even know. But she's um, she's a young, you know, she's in her teens and she's amazing. Um, you know, her voice sounds really nice to begin with. So she has a warm sounding voice. And, you know, she was singing <clears throat> she was singing a certain style of, of songs that were pop. And until until I became, you know, until I did a few lessons with her, I became more aware. And it's like, oh, here's a video of me playing piano. And like before she was playing Billy Joel. And all of a sudden it's like you know, the fifth movement of, by, by this particular, um, you know, uh, classical piece. And I'm like, holy smokes, like I'm teaching her how to sing and she already sings great, but giving her lessons to coach her and she's already playing like classical pieces, like, wow, you know, but, but it just goes to show that, you know, you strengthen, you want to strengthen these different areas. And I think that another thing that I, I, I teach is that you want to be an MVP most valuable player. You don't just want to do one thing. You want to do multiple things. If you're a guitar player, then you should take up singing really seriously because that makes you double fist, you know, like how about Stevie Wonder? You know, the guy plays drums, he plays harmonica, he, he plays keyboards, he sings like, like a bird, you know, it's, and he writes and he's, and he plays harmonica. I mean, he's, he plays everything like clavinet, you know, all kinds of stuff. Fives. I mean, and he, and he's, and I met Stevie. I was in an airport in, in Washington, D.C., and, you know, we're sitting there on the train to the plane. And Stevie's, you know, he wasn't sitting there moving his head or anything, but he was there tapping on his uh, brief, on his briefcase while we we're sitting there. He was He's constantly thinking about music, constantly working. I mean, that's what it's about. It's about constantly improving yourself or constantly creating. And I think, you know, having these different mediums to do it, you know, I was 
when I was in Anthrax, no one would let me touch their instrument. You know, they didn't want to share. They didn't want to let me do that. But I have a lot of guitars. I mean, I write songs on guitar. When I was in Anthrax, I did write, you know, the, the riff in the verse for Death From Above. And but but having that that outlet to be able to create, um, you know, riffs that you're hearing as a singer, I was always hearing these riffs. But it makes it a lot easier, a lot better if you can play an instrument to share that idea. So if I was going to share an idea with you, here, may I, I could share it with you vocally. You know, I can I can vocally uh, explain the idea, or because I've been playing guitar, I can share it on the guitar. It makes it a lot. It translates a lot better. And of course, for demos and things like that. But you become a much more valuable component to a band, much more attractive if you can sing backups. Because there might be that moment where that singer gets a problem like strep throat or they they couldn't show up. They got in a car accident. All these things have happened. And then all of a sudden, hey, you can sing the song. Isn't that fantastic? Wow, that's really nice, dude. And before we uh, before I ask you the next number, let's just say welcome to Spinhos e Rosa Oficial. Fala aí, galera do Spinhos e Rosa de Salvador, Bahia. Tamo junto, sejam todos bem-vindos. All right, so welcome. One more number. I can't remember everything you said, but welcome. Yeah, welcome. It's a band called Espinhos e Rosa. That's a band from the city called Salvador, from Bahia. It's a state from Brazil. Well, sounds like I need to come visit Brazil really soon. Oh yeah, please come to Brazil and let's play some songs. And I think it would be really, really nice. And please come to Belo Horizonte. It's my town. <laughs> That would be fun. Really great. So, one more number. Sure. Oh, for me? Okay. Yeah. Well, number one. Okay. Because nobody likes being number two. <laughs> of course not. Only if you want to uh, wanna be the player two on, on video games. Like if you want to play with Luigi on my Super Mario Bros. <laughs> <laughs> either, you, either you're a leader or you're a follower. You know, it's one or the other. There's not... You can you can try to do both, but it's better to it's better to be a, a trailblazer than a trail follower. Yeah, original, yeah. You know, an orig, uh, someone who's original versus copycat. Yeah, of course. So, question number one: If you could choose a musician to compose a song with you, which musician would you choose? Oh, I think we have bad connections. Uh, Neil, could you, could you hear me? I heard part. I heard musician and then bad connection. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna repeat hear the, the question. I'm gonna repeat the question again. So, if you could choose a musician to compose a song with you, which musician would you choose? Well, that's really tough. You know, that's so tough because there's so many reasons that I like different artists, different singers, different people. If I could choose a musician to write with. Wow. Well, you know, then it becomes alive or dead. Well, <laughs> you yeah, know, I think both. You could choose both ones. Yeah, it would be, you know, this is like a fantasy question, but I would say that, you know, writing with the Beatles would be pretty amazing. Um, writing with the Stones would be pretty amazing. Writing with Chopin or, uh, Oh, damn it. Uh, really cool. Uh, new, uh, sorry, because I think uh, in those terms of classical compositions. Uh, uh, sorry. Sure. Um, we, uh, you, you stopped. Um, you would like to compose with Chopin, and it stopped. <laughs> well, I think that's pretty much, you know, Chopin was able to, without any vocals or any other, you know, just piano, he was able to bring out, you know, raw emotions and people just based on, on the, you know, the way he played his intervals, his complex way of, you know, his, his fingers, you know, he just had a, a, a way of communicating is what it is. It's, it's mathematical and it's physics. It's all, it's all coming across, you know, through that medium. And I think Bach, Beethoven, you know, all of these amazing composers like that, Jimi Hendrix, you know, someone who's a prodigy, someone who has vision, so, the Beatles, um, it would, you know, and that's not even breaching the heavy metal world of, of writers. I mean, Deep Purple, 
Richie Blackmore. That would have been cool to, you know, do that. Uh, Black Sabbath, I think, to ACDC. I mean, it would be cool to, to have the opportunity. But the Beatles and the Stones, you know, it's pretty hard to beat that when it comes to writing a song. And just the fact that I'm writing a song and, and, and a couple of the guys from Tom Petty's band, the Heartbreakers, are on the tracks, that's exciting for me. It's one of those kind of, you know, fantasies that I, I might have had. And like, who would ever think? I was just, I was, I was blown away that I wrote songs with Frankie Benali and Neil Citron from Quiet Riot. So to me, it's like I've already had those moments of, of like the wow, you know, I can't believe this is happening. But yeah, I would say, you know, if there was a way, way to resurrect people that you admire, that you, that you look up to and ones that were wonderful writers, you know, the thing about Jimi Hendrix, just to point it out, is that, you know, of course, his big hit was all along the watchtower, but he did the song, Hey Joe. And if you heard the original version of Hey Joe, it was like, you know, Chaz Chandler wanted to find someone to sing the song. And he was managing Jimmy at the time. And it's like, okay, well, we'll get Jimmy to sing it. And he was trying to place the song originally. And what Jimmy did with that song, he took it to another level. You know, it wasn't, it was more of like this, this real subdued kind of song. But when Jimmy played on it, it just, and Jimmy's vocals weren't like Rob Halford. You know, he wasn't like Freddie Mercury, but he knew how to use his voice the right way. And he, he understood, you know, from a, 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 a trailblazing perspective how to take it to another level so to me having an opportunity to write a song with someone who thinks like that someone who has that kind of vision and and um, approach you know to me that's exciting so it's not just about hey let's pick your favorite band and write with them it's more like hey these guys can really write songs and like the beatles wrote sergeant pepper i mean that is some of that music is just incredible What's going on? There's multiple things going on at once. And the Stones, you know, they write amazing songs still to this day. So I have much respect for, for those artists. And then there's other artists that are in other genres even that I would choose. But I would say, yeah, it would be, I mean, that would be a very long list. And um, I think that a band where I could bring something, where I could bring something to unique to their their sound, I think that would be really the the thing that would kind of motivate me to want to stay with that artist so yeah if i had a chance to sing on on jimmy jimmy hendrix songs it wouldn't be jimmy anymore you know it would be his playing but it wouldn't be his vocal so it's kind of like that's the dynamic that changes the the you know that's a factor that that changes the dynamic so i think you got to figure out which is the right the, you know where do i fit in with that music the most so yeah there's there's some artists that i'd love to write with i mean no doubt about it and some of them, and some of those artists are great singers already, so they don't really need a singer. <laughs> but it would just be cool to write with them. Oh yeah, really great, dude. So um, now the last number. Oh, last number. Okay. Well, I'll say ten because you always got to you always got to play because on ten. We don't have ten. We just have until nine. Well, how about eleven? That's like one more than ten. Just kidding. All right. Well, we'll go with. Uh, <laughs> We'll go with number three, because that was uh, Babe Ruth. All right. So number three. Okay. If you could choose a band or a solo artist to go on a tour with you, which one would you pick? A band or a solo artist? Well, um, you know, as much as I like good people, that would be my first pick. But, uh, you know, It'd be a lot of fun to open up for a band like ACDC or, you know, a huge band like that in the, in the hard and heavy genre. So I would say that um, that would be, that would probably be a, a pick of that I'd have uh, other artists that would be in that capacity. Because, um, you know, if you're going to go on tour, you want to be doing well, right? And, and I would say you're doing pretty well if you're opening up for ACDC. But the other side of that is you're going to be opening up for ACDC fans. Or you're going to be opening up for Iron Maiden fans or Rush fans. You know, they're paying, those fans are paying to go see those bands. They're not going to pay to see you. Like, you're playing, that's cool. But you know that people are going to see ACDC. That's just a fact of life. And also, you'll play for 
a less amount of time. So people might just be getting to their seats while you're playing your last song. So there is that factor, but I'd say that, yeah, it's pretty hard to not want to play in front of a band like ACDC, but then the other side of it is like, you don't want to, like, you just don't want to, if you sound too good, then, you know, maybe, maybe they'll mess up your sound or something. If you're, if you're playing in front of a, you know, a GNR or an ACDC or, you know, I mean, cause the show is about ACDC. The show is about GNR. The show is about Metallica. But I would say that, um, you know, any one of those bands would be a good band for me to play in front of because, you know, it's hard and heavy sound and still rock and still metal and still, you know, moments of metal with GNR. ACDC, you know, just heavy. Some of their moments can be considered metal. So I, I would say and Metallica, of course, is metal. But they also are great songwriters. And they have very, you know, actually pop oriented songs that are metal in some cases. So, because they're well-written songs, you know, there's great melodies. So I think any one of those bands would be a, a really good fit. But of course, if we were just going based on how cool the band is, you know, there's, there's a whole other list of, of players I'd love to have a chance to go play with on tour. You know, good wow. people, there's camaraderie where people treat each other good and have, you know, consideration and empathy and respect, that sort of thing. I think that's that's really important. When you have that on a tour with bands, I think, you know, that that lifts it up to another level because you can see the fun that people are having and also the camaraderie and the consideration, you know, when people are treated well. When you treat people right, you know. Yeah. And, and yeah, there's sure. a lot a lot of things on tour that can go wrong, you know, a lot of little things that you know, your your 9 volt battery, you know, <laughs> there's all kinds of things. You can't find out where the the hum is coming from, you know, the tech is running across the stage. You're trying to figure it out in the middle of a song and the drum set fell over, you know, all kinds of things. Or the, the wireless mic doesn't work or the in-ears don't work, you know, just a million things that can go sideways. There's a lot that goes into a show. So I think, yeah, having, having a band and having a, a great, a great uh, operation, a great touring band that has a good crew that really knows what they're doing. And being part of that production would be really cool. Really nice. All right. So this is the end of the block. If you and we're on the end of our live, unfortunately. So, Neil, first of all, I would like to thank you so much for this moment here with us. I think we have actually we have more comments here um, from the people. Uh, hey, Neil. Salve, Guilherme. And Psicodela said, what a great moment. He has must, he, he must have had a blast playing and songwriting with all those legends. Yeah, we were talking about this some minutes ago. And Dennis Augusto, he said, Festival of Metal is a great album. Wow, that's really Thank awesome. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> that's it. So, it was an honor to be part of it. And, uh, you know, I definitely put my 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 contributions forth in that yeah really i give great. credit i want to give credit to all all people that were in anthrax not just the people that are in it today but also people that uh should should have credit which would be debt you know which would also be um greg greg walls who was a guitar player when i joined the band and also um dave weiss who is the original drummer they got into a hit and run accident So he was also in the band when I joined and he was out of the band, you know, pretty quickly because he was really hurt. And um, also Greg D'Angelo, who is um, a phenomenal drummer, a great guy. And, you know, was definitely in Anthrax for a good period of time, you know, through 82 and 83. And, you know, I got to play with Greg and he joined Cities and then White Lion. But I mean, he was a phenomenal part of the band and, and Greg Walls, you know, he, he was definitely a part of Anthrax. So I just want to give credit and a shout out to, um, to both Greg's because part of Anthrax at that point in time, both of them left the band while I was in the band, you know, and I was just like, Oh no. <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, so I had been through some things in that band where, you know, there was members that I got along just fine with, you know, and they got along with me and we had respect and there was camaraderie and, decency and empathy and um 
you know, unfortunately they left the band and, you know, Dave Weiss didn't have much of a choice. He got hit by a car going 60 miles an hour. So they're also part of the, the history and, and part of the way to Fistful of Metal. You know, and they did shows. They did, uh, we were in the studio doing a interview with Liz Derringer, the wife of, at the time of Rick Derringer in New York City. We were doing this thing at SIR Studios for Unique. Uh, it was a TV, cable TV show, Unique something or other. Unique Talent Showcase, I think it was. And uh, that was played on cable TV in New York City. So no one's heard of that, but that's part of the history. I think there's some videos that Greg Walls has on his on his uh, YouTube page that actually show those uh, con- those those actual performances. So I don't know. Somehow, Anthrax wasn't really talking about it, but it was Anthrax's history, and I was there. So and and so was Greg D'Angelo, and so was Greg Walls. So I don't know. I, I believe in having integrity and giving credit where credit's due to, to all the people that deserve it, not just some of the people. Wow, wow, really great, dude. So, um, so I would like to thank you once again, Neil, uh, about this interview. That was really, really awesome. Thank you so much. I would like to say thank you, everyone who was, who was watching us right here on YouTube. Oh, muito obrigado a todos que estiveram aqui conosco, nos assistindo aqui no YouTube, aqui no nosso Rock Wave edição especial. Muitíssimo obrigado a todos. E lembrando, vou dar um toque aqui em vocês no dia 25 de maio deste mês, às três horas da tarde, na terça-feira, daqui duas terças-feiras, nós teremos aqui Key Marcelo, da ban- que foi da banda Eros. So, we're gonna have May the 25th, Key Marcelo, X Eros. So, stay tuned for our next interviews, and thank you so much, everyone. Key so- Marcelo, great, great, great guitar player, and I saw him play with Europe. When they first came, I think he was playing with them at the Wiltern Theater when they first came to L.A. In 1985, I was at the concert at the Wiltern. And by the oh, way. Oh, no. Oh, my by God. The way, so you must be on the That never dies. Dude. My band, Neil Turbin, East Los, we played this festival with uh, Toxic and Whiplash. And this was a couple of years ago, 2019. So um, Neil Turbin, East Los, check us out. And that's who I'll be playing with playing the thrash music really great so new thank you so much once again keep thrashing so thank you so much in name of fresh tv you were awesome dude so thank you Jeremy. Hope- and thank you to all the people out there on crash tv and all the people in brazil and everybody that's watching and uh yeah you got to go check out key marcello key marcello since uh, he's a shredding great guitar player from from sweden right yeah that's it sweden They got all the good guitar players here and Brazil. Really great. So, Neil, thank you so much. Have a good night and have a good week. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you this Thursday on Instagram with a new um, with a new guest. So, see you around, people. And thank you. And thank you, Teddy. Teddy Reyes. <laughs> <laughs>